Uh, Pat is, is the person who I have the most notes for, and I pretty much looked at it and I was just like, we're never going to get through all of this. So we'll do our best, uh, but we really do need all of the time. Uh, and so on Handmade Hero, one of the things that I get asked all the time, like all the time, uh, is about network programming. And people are like, are we going to do networking? Are we going to do networking? And my answer is always, no, we're not going to do networking, because I am like the last person you should ask about network programming. Like, I've literally never shipped a piece of code in anything that does networking. Like, my, my experience with networking is like internal tools only. Uh, and I, I shudder to think what would have happened to these tools if they had been deployed in the wild. I'm sure they would break like immediately. Uh, and so what I wanted to do uh, for this session was to sort of get the person who I thought knew absolutely the most about game networking to sort of fill that in in whatever we can do in an hour to sort of answer those questions um, where it's like everyone wants to know more about this. So maybe I felt like we could get a perspective on it. So Pat Wyatt uh, is somebody who's, uh, like I think I, I said this on the actual diagram, he's the person I think of who had the only network game that like shipped with like no problem somehow. Like it was like perfect. Uh, and that was Guild Wars. And it was just this, <laughs> it was this like amazing feat of engineering that it actually had the launch that it did. Um, and, uh, and because basically everything else at that time was just like, oh yeah, the day that they launched the game, like World of Warcraft, the server immediately goes down or whatever else happened. And so I was like, he had plenty of experience with it working um, on previous titles on, on Warcraft and on Diablo. Uh, and then when he went to do uh, Guild Wars, that was kind of like the nth generation of his network coding. So I was hoping uh, I could sort of get at some of that knowledge and have him give us an overview of like, what does it take to ship these games that are played by like, you know, literally millions of people and how do you go about designing it? Uh, so please give a warm welcome to Mr. Pat Wyatt. Thank you. All right, so give people some context here because uh, this was something that, uh, that I was kind of curious about as well. Like, the first network game you worked on, was it Warcraft? Um, no, actually it was, was there one before uh, that? Battle Chess. Uh, so I ported Battle really? Chess from, there's a DOS and Amiga version, and I did the Windows 3.0 version. <laughs> Uh, it was on, on modem, of course. OK. So this is a modem version of Battle Chess was your first experience with network programming. That's right. OK. So Warcraft was actually like a second generation thing in some sense. You'd already had some experience. And this was before the internet, for the most part, was used in gaming, I Th believe, right? That's right. It's local network only. So tell me a little bit about that development process. Like, what was it like? You, you know, how did you guys go about doing that, that network development? So, because I can't, I don't even know like what was involved at that time. Yeah, well, so because the internet didn't exist, I sort of had to invent the whole idea of how this would be done whole cloth. And uh, one of the first, uh, you know, immediately obvious things was we had about, um, uh, I think, 600 units that were going to be running around in the game. And when I started working out the math of like, well, if every unit's sending its orders of what it's doing all the time, then we're just going to totally saturate our 2400 baud modem. <laughs> 2400 baud <Right>? modem. <laughs> That's right. OK. Uh, and so it was immediately obvious it was an impractical solution to try and send what each unit was doing. And so um, like, I'm not sure exactly how I came up with it, but um, I figured that what I would do is instead just send the processed user input. So when the user clicked on a map, uh, like then I would send, well, he clicked here, and you know he had these units selected. Go tell those units to do that. And so both both computers would work in lockstep with each other, so that um, you only had to send the processed input, which is very very tiny. In fact, you can fit you know like a 300 baud modem or something to do the job. And so uh, for those synchronous models, right? Obviously, the latency becomes a bit of an issue potentially. No, I mean like so so how did you guys? I mean. Warcraft, obviously, being a real-time strategy game, isn't the most Twitch-oriented, but it's still real-time response. So how, how did that play out in the code? So actually, it's really interesting. So RTSs, by and large, are not very Twitchy. Yeah. Because what happens is you're busy giving so many different orders at the same time that you don't really need to see the action take effect instantaneously. So in the single-player version, there's actually no delay. You click on a unit, and immediately it starts executing the action. But in the multiplayer version, we have like a, I mean, it's a tunable parameter for some of the earlier games, and we just set it to a hard-coded value in later versions. Um, but basically, you say, you, go to this. And it's like, yes, my liege. And then it starts going. <laughs> right? and, it, and it's because like, what happens is you send the order out, and uh, you have several uh, packets in flight. And you know, everybody's got these packets in flight all the time. And so it takes a while for that to get to the other side. And then you're, you, know, you might get the packet early, but you don't start processing that packet until it's time for that packet to happen. And so uh, there's sort of like this long queue of, like uh, I think, 400 milliseconds before your actions need to take effect. And if it doesn't get there by then, then the game will um, it'll still allow you to, to like, you know, click buttons and do things. But um, really, the, the simulation has stalled out, and the units stop moving. 
Interesting. Until like, you know, you start getting packets again from all the players. So sort of the architecture of that original Warcraft networking model was something like, I have a queue of user input, basically, and they might just be doing a bunch of stuff, and it's getting stacked up, and it really, I start sending it out, and until I get confirmation back that the next sort of like step has occurred, I can't actually pull anything, you know, I can't actually consider one of these uh, UI options executed. So I'm just kind of trying to buy time until that happens. Is that, right. is that similar to I just to wait until I get packets from every single player in the game. And it you know, scales naturally to two to eight players in Warcraft uh, 2 yeah. and Starcraft. And you, as soon as you've got everybody's packet, then you can execute the turn, although you, you generally wait until it's like, you know, enough time has elapsed. Oh, so I think okay. we're doing like four turns, four network turns per second in Warcraft 1. So basically what happens uh, is all of the people send sort of a I guess what I'm, what, I'm, uh, what I'm hearing you say there, which is not sort of the way I was picturing it when you first said it. So there's basically like fixed slices of time, these 400 milliseconds, like you said, it was a tunable parameter. There's fixed slices of time, and basically everyone is going to get to make a move in that time, and that move may be I didn't make a move, Correct. but everyone's going to get to send what their move was. And it, if I don't hear from anybody, we just keep running out the clock if, if we don't hear from everybody in that time, or? That's right, for the next couple seconds, like I'll still take input on yeah. the local client side. And then after, uh, like if I haven't heard from anybody from, I'm just gonna guess like five seconds, then I actually gray out the screen so you can't do anything, gotcha. because clearly we now have Something a network issue. Okay. And so people get the idea that, oh, I'm not uh, enabled to do anything. So that's pretty interesting. That, I guess, in that sense, that's a pretty clean division of the networking code from everything else, too. It's like it can almost exist in a vacuum, because as long as you really the only thing, I guess, that you need from the game at that point is the ability to not, you know, the ability to just not execute something. But that should be pretty easy, because if the user's not doing anything, it doesn't execute something. That's right. OK, so that's, that's actually kind of cool. So, and, and, and I would say, like, it would be really nice. Yes, it could be so easily isolated and everything. But if you were to look at the code, you go, like, where is it? It's, it's everywhere. It's spread out. Oh, really? Whoops. Yeah, the first Warcraft was a mess. OK, OK. So uh, was that, uh, is, is that, but that would be something that is fixable? Meaning the, yes. the integration into it isn't necessary. It's just how it happened to organically occur. That's right. I Organic see. is a good word for that. OK. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was my first uh, like original development project. So I had to learn along the way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so moving forward, I guess, then, for like Warcraft 2, for example, same sort of thing? Yeah, like really not a whole lot had to change. Um, you know, there are a lot of data structures that just assume two players, and so there'd, there'd just be, you know, Boolean values for them, and then it's like, oh, we're going to do eight players now. Well, we can pack eight players into one byte, right? Okay. Just one bit flag for each uh, entry. And so um, it was really more uh, a failure of vision that Warcraft 2 Warcraft 1 didn't have more players in it. It's like, okay. we could do two players. Oh my gosh, that's a lot, right? You know, we could have done more, but we were thinking about modem play. I see, I see. And then by that time, it had kind of gotten a little bit better in terms of, uh, of what it could support and how many people... I guess with Warcraft, you learn what people might want to do, which is play eight-player games or other things like this. That's right. Okay, so from there, the next title is, is sort of drastically different, I guess, is, is my understanding. So, you then did the networking layer for Diablo, which is, you did the, the part where it's the actual in-game networking layer, right? I guess someone else was responsible for the battle net back end sort of system. That's right. So Diablo is not synchronous in this way, is that correct? Right, so um, Diablo was actually developed by another company uh, that was acquired by Blizzard Entertainment. Uh, it was a bunch of guys uh, at Condor. Um, and they had this great idea, like Diablo is their idea. And uh, when we heard about it, we're like, this is awesome, we need to be doing this game with them. Um, but they were making a single player, single character game, and okay. we convinced them that they should do a multiplayer. Oh, uh, and then eventually when we convinced them to do the multiplayer, they're like, we want it to be turn-based multiplayer. I'm like, no, 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 it's got to be real time. Okay. Um, and so we, we, you know, when we convinced them to do that, it's like, okay, so go do that. Uh, and then like, they really needed some help to get it done, and so I actually flew up there with a plan to go and figure out how to help them. And it was going to be a synchronous uh, network model, like the, similar to Warcraft. Yeah, exactly, because I'd already done that, and uh, it would prevent cheating. Um, and you know, I looked at the code. It's like you know, it's going to be really hard to back end a synchronous system into a game that's already been written and like um, doesn't really have like the data construct where it's thinking about like let's keep the server stuff over here, you know, like the simulation stuff over here and the game stuff over here. It's all just intermixed. 
And okay, so, so then when you, when you threw say, everything out the window and, and wrote a different network model. So when you say that, uh, you, you kind of mean that my representation for a particular object in the world in something like Warcraft is a little more split in terms of, like, like explain a little bit more what you mean by, by you looked at the code and found something you didn't expect in terms of that welding. Sure. So um, if you're doing a network simulation, you want to ideally have all your network data structures separate because they're going to get modified only when packets show up that should be affecting that data. And your simulation data, I mean, I'm sorry, your, your um, user interface data is probably going to be separate because, like, you know, I'm, I'm tweaking things. I have status bar updates for these units. Um, there's lots of stuff that the network code um, and the client code are going to have that are different because of the time that that changes, right? The, okay. the simulation can only change when packets show up. And the client data can change instantaneously as I click the mouse and click okay. the keyboard and things. And so in something like Warcraft 2, where you'd already had some experience with it, you guys had sort of gotten to the point where you were already dividing the code base up into this way, uh, I guess, is, is sort of the thing. But when you went to their code base, that's, you know, it was all still kind right. of intermixed. Yeah, also, the other factor is uh, when you're doing synchronous lockstep games, the problem is you cannot have any coding errors. Because if, you, um, okay. if you've played one game already and you've initialized your, some of your internal state variables slightly differently than mine, I'm playing my first game, then um, you, know, you do a command and it doesn't behave exactly the same on your system as it does on my system, and the games desynchronize and we, all we right. can do is disconnect because we don't know what else to do. So basically there's divergence there because of some state that was not cleanly initialized. That's I mean. right. And so you have to be exceptionally careful. And it's just ridiculous how hard this is, right? Like, uh, you know, accidental pointer use of after the pointer's been freed or uninitialized variables or, you know, static variables that don't get reinitialized. Right. Like, lots of things can really impact this. And so um, it takes a long time to find these bugs, too. And like Diablo was written in haste, and it just didn't have the same level of um, like carefulness with, with respect to variables. And so there was just no way to do a synchronous lockstep game with that. And so what was your approach then? So you, you decide to change things up. You're like, we're going to have to do something different. What was that thought process like? Because you said you came up with their other yeah. plan, and now the plan is gone. Right? That's right. That's... So I came up with a plan in like a day, and it's what I call like an asynchronous, loosely coupled game. Okay. So we're all playing sort of the same game, but not exactly. Okay. So you happen to be the first person to get onto like level one of the game, and so you're now the master for that level. And when I come to the game, to come down to that level of the game. So for people who haven't played Diablo, like you know, 16 level dungeon. Okay. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a master for each level. Okay. Um, so I, I get and to And the your master level. is whoever happens to load up that level first Correct. in some way. How do we know that? Because it's network, so I don't know who loaded first. Well, like, you created the game. Uh, okay. And then I join into your game. Okay. And so, like, you have the authority to, to, like, you know, you're the first person on, like, level zero, the town level. Okay. And then you go down to level one, you know, and then when I join your game, you see that I go down to level two first, and so you're like, Okay, you're the master for level two, and as long as I'm in the game, I'm the master. If I, I were to see. drop out, then there'd be no master, or arguably you could say, like, you know, um, any of them could pick up the master position. So uh, let's just drill down on that for one second. Uh, so that sounds like sort of a consensus problem across these clients, though, because, like, when I say I see that you drop down to level two first, how do I know, like, how do I know that I've seen that? at the right time, or how does another client know? Like, is there some kind of centralized, like the person who owned level zero is the person who decides who owns level one, or how does that, like, because I mean, in networking, things can come in at any time, and you never really know who said what when, right? That's right. So the, like, the person who created the game is sort of the, the arbiter of who is the level master for each level. Okay. And then if that player drops out, then the next player who came into the game was, you know, and like, they're just increasing the sequence. I see. Numbers. Okay, so basically, the person who started the game, they are the master, and they will be periodically sending out a list of who's in the game, and your order in that, where they are first and the next person second, third, is like the order will go through to keep trying to play this game if something bad happens, kind of a thing. That's right. Okay. So you are the master for the game, I go to level two, and, you're, and you tell me, okay, you're level master for two, and so I'm like, great, I get to initialize everything myself and tell people what's going on on that level. I see. And then after that point, um, so now I've taken over ownership of level two, and I'm like, you know, I'm picking up things and dropping them, and I'm telling all the other players, yeah, I picked up this item and dropped this item. So if I drop out of the game, and then we need a new level two master, then somebody else can pick it up, and they can sort of apply all the knowledge of what happened there previously. Like, there's dead monsters here, and this uh, this treasure and has been uh, this treasure chest has been broken open. Then they can reapply all those rules so that the world seems consistent. I see, and so they kind of keep a buffer of here's all the stuff I've been told about level two, even though I myself am not actually keeping a representation of level two yet. That's right. So at that time, if we do need to do like basically a failover or something like this, or if I come on to level two, I guess would be another case where I just am starting to look at level two, 
I'm going to go in and take this buffer that I've been recording of everything that I've been told about level two, and I'm going to replay it That's in right. order to get my level two to that state. That's right. And our lists may not match up exactly because of you know, um, hacking or things like that. And so uh, it's, that's why I call it loosely coupled, because yeah. we're really playing two games that are nearly identical. But it's obviously very, very cheatable. And so what happens now as the game is being played, two of us are both on the same level and we're doing stuff. What is that, what is that networking process like? We, one person is the master for the level, and then we have n number of other people who are sort of getting you know, information about it. But what does that actually look like? Um, yeah, so um, we're all broadcasting messages to all the other players saying, you know, this is what happened. Um, so, like, I pick up, you know, a, a sword and I start, you know, I tell all the other players that that sword is now gone. And so you can have a race condition for that. Yeah. And we just sort of arbitrate it, um, like, you know, the level master gets to make the determination of who actually got that. So basically two people, it, you know, in their separate copies of this game, they both go to pick up the sword, right? And they both think that they've picked up the sword, so they send out the packet, I picked up the sword. Well, more like I am attempting to pick up the sword. Okay, so there's actually a, like a, a two-stage process. I'm attempting to pick up the sword. Two packets come in you know, that we can't really tell who maybe was doing it first or whatever, so the level master goes, I see two people are trying to pick up the sword, and I decided to break this tie however I decided to break it. That's Any right. particular nuance to that, or it's like doesn't really matter? No, it's pretty straightforward. It's okay. whoever got it first. And of course, if okay. you're the level master, you're always going to be faster because it's <laughs> a local, local loop back. <laughs> Okay, and so that, uh, and that, is that roughly the way that most things in the game work? So if I try to attack somebody, is it a similar two-stage process? I'm trying to attack this person, and then the level master acknowledges it, and only once he acknowledges it do I actually see the attack occur? Or is it more asynchronous than that, in that I see the attack occur either way, but maybe the damage goes back up later if it turns out it didn't acknowledge? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, in terms of, like, how does that work out when, when we're actually doing other sorts of things besides something as discreet as picking up the sword? Right, so it's really loose. So, like, you go and attack a monster on your system, and you kill him, and you decide that he's dead, and then you let me know that he's dead, okay. and I'm the level master, and I go, okay, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, it's really possible to cheat very easily, right? You can just kill anything as fast as you want. And that isn't really, but I mean, ignoring the cheating part of it. In terms of actually keeping the stuff working in the actual game, it's not really necessary to do anything beyond that. Meaning, if, if a bunch of people who are all trying to play the game legitimately not hacking it, not trying to do anything weird, then simply having the clients announce when they did something, and if two people say that they killed the monster, it doesn't matter, because like the state just goes to dead and so it's fine, that That's kind of right. thing? Right, the only area of contention is in picking up things off the ground. Okay. Or, or like uh, breaking open a chest. Actually no, okay. even that doesn't because the chest is broken open, both players might have done it at the same time, but it leads to like things popping out on the ground that you can then pick up that are the areas that you fight over. So the only, cause, and is that because things like damage are just numbers that go down? So if I get two people who say they did damage, I just apply them both, or like, like what's the, is that just because picking up is the one thing where it's like there was only one item and we need to know Correct. who had it kind of a thing? Exactly. Okay. All right, so I think that's pretty good fundamentals. I'm trying to think if I missed anything of, of the yes, sort of... You missed one thing. Don't yes. do a game like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why not? Uh, because people will cheat. Okay. Um, and in fact, the thing that happened was, you know, Diablo came out and people really loved the game and a lot of player players had fun, particularly when they played with their own friends. But as soon as you played out there in the larger universe, um, there are just lots of people who were griefing. And in fact, uh, you know, it was really startling to me because, you know, I'd played MUDs before and things like that, and occasionally there was griefing, but usually you had like uh, GMs that would oversee things, like volunteer GMs, who would sort of like make sure that people weren't complete assholes. Right, right. Um, but so like a couple days after we shipped Diablo, like uh, there was a friend of the company who uh, came in and he was playing in an office adjacent to me, uh, a guy named Yash, and he's just like going into dungeons and he's killing people because he's much higher level than them, and there's nothing that they could do about it. And like, so you know, all their armor and swords and everything pop off onto the ground, and then they get re you know, reincarnated in town, and they come down to the dungeon naked and trying to recover their stuff, and he kills them again! <laughs> and again, and this again, This was at your own company. And he taunts them. Well, he was actually just a friend of somebody who worked in the Okay, company. just a friend, okay. And I was like, I watched him, you know, and I realized that this was a microcosm of stuff that was gonna happen. Right. So like, I didn't say, you saw the I, I didn't say like, you shouldn't do this or anything like that. Instead, I was like, let me understand this. And that's really my first serious experience with griefers. And um, I mean, it was shocking at that time. And now, like every game I've ever designed since, uh, you know, I have to think about like how are people going to hack this, and how are people going to, you know, especially abuse others, which is in some ways even worse than hacking. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So that's actually kind of fascinating. So moving forward, I guess uh, the next one you did was Guild Wars, yes? 
uh, StarCraft was, and then Guild Wars. But, okay, so you did the network on StarCraft as well. Yeah, it was a lot of the same stuff. Was that uh, asynchronous or was that synchronous? Was, was that more like the Warcraft model? Just like Warcraft 2, Okay, yeah. just like Warcraft 2. Okay, so after StarCraft, uh, you go to start Guild Wars. And uh, I remember Guild Wars was particularly impressive to me because like, I remember like the download to download Guild Wars was like this little tiny thing, right? Yeah. There was some kind of like little tiny executable and it just like took care of everything from there and all this sort of, sorts of stuff. That's right, it was a 200K executable 200K. roughly. And so the challenge was that it was so small that people would click on it to download and it would go so fast they'd be like, uh, did that work? <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should have made it bigger. We had to pad it out just to make sure they can see the progress bar. That's right. Uh, so Guild Wars is, uh, in some ways, a lot more ambitious than Diablo because this now is sort of designed up front to have a lot of the permanence maybe backed up by more authenticated sorts of things, I guess. This comes out of your experience with the griefing on Diablo, I guess, is that, uh, would that That's be right. fair? And okay. also the desire to have an online economy. Okay, okay. So this one, uh, I guess, well, I got kind of a list of things to, to drill down in here, but before I, I maybe ask any of those questions, can you give maybe people a brief understanding of what was involved in making Guild Wars happen? Because it's, it's, both, it's got both a persistent state and it's got a peer-to-peer -peer thing happening and those things interact and there's just, I remember you sent me an email where you're like, here's all the servers we wrote for Guild Wars and there was like 12 or something on this list. So can you just give a brief, just high level explanation of what was involved in just, just the basic architecture of this of sure. system? Sure, so first, uh, it was not a peer-to-peer -peer game at all. It was a client server only. So, uh, oh, so even when people were playing inside their own, uh, when, when they would kind of spawn off the dungeon, that was still always round tripped through a separate server. That's right. Okay, it's sorry. Fully yeah, server right. hosted. Um, so the very first thing you do is you connect up to the server and say, hi, I'm Guild Wars version zero, because you've got this 200k stub, and it's like, oh, you need version 53, here yeah. you go. Download, you reboot uh, the, the game engine. Um, oh, hey, I'm version 53, what should I get? Okay, great, you're up to date. Uh, here's the manifests for every single piece of data in the whole world. Okay. Um, you know, and you download that file, and then you say, well, I want to go to the login screen. Give me all the files I need for that. And you download those, and you, you know, progressively you start accumulating all the files you need so that you never actually have to download the entire, roughly at that point, three gigabytes of data. You could just download the, the tiny portion that you need. Um, so this was actually sort of like an on-demand package manager you basically had in here, which is like, right. we have a dependency system. We know everything in the world and what it depends on. So when the game starts up, it just kind of asks for some kind of like a root object for what it's trying to do. Like, I'm trying to go into this dungeon, so I need, you know, I, I ask for that. And then it starts pulling in things, and you're like, okay, now I'm gonna ask for this, and that pulls in more things. These exactly. get downloaded into sort of a cache on the drive that That's you right. keep? Okay. And those are marked in some way to tell whether they're stale in case they're updated, or does that yes, never happen? Every file effectively uh, is an ID number okay. that is both the, the identity for it and the version number. Okay. And so you can, um, you can know whether you're up to date on the file. And so if it turns out that you're out of date, you can say, I have version 17 of the warrior armor, and it goes, oh, and then if you look in the manifest, it's like, oh, I need version uh, 19. So you say to the file server, you know, want 19, have 17. And it loads up both those files, Delta compresses them, uh, Seriously? The, well, actually, it deltas them, then it compresses them and sends you down that small chunk because this was 2005 when we were doing this. Actually, 2002 when we were writing the code for it. And, you know, like bandwidth was much lower than yeah. it is today. So we had to make everything as small as possible. Otherwise, it would have been hours and hours and hours before you could get into the game. That's awesome. Okay, so, so you on demand delta compress the difference between the version they have and the version they need That's right. and send only the delta down. Correct. That's like better than most internet infrastructure probably is <laughs> everywhere in the world right now, but okay. Um, so uh, going back to sort of the, the that, that sort of process of getting things, right. you said the ID number and the, you, you said it's, it's both the ID and the version, you mean they're, they're together or the ID is somehow intermixed with the version? It's just two separate pieces of data, ID and version? Or? That's right, so every, okay, yeah. so every file has uh, a base ID, which is the okay. very first file number that was assigned to it when the asset was created. Okay. So you know, I create a, a texture it's like, well, you just have to be number three, right? And okay. so and I can, forevermore, I can refer to that texture as three, but now it has different version numbers. So like, you know, it's also, uh, you know, file 17 and file 28. You know, every time the artist changes it, that texture gets a new, a, a number with it. And so I always refer to it by the, by the base ID, and I look in the manifest for it, and it's like, for the base ID three, the current version is 781. I see. And I say, I need 781, and I have three or 17 or whatever the previous version I had. 
And so, uh, sorry, this is just kind of fascinating, so sorry, <laughs> this is not technically that. There's a couple years of my life, so I'm Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, and just one other question about that, I guess, uh, because we sort of talked about this with, with, uh, when we were talking about Super Meat Boy as well, and what Tommy was doing, and it's just kind of fresh in my head. Like, how do you assign these IDs to things that artists make? Because by, you know, by definition, an artist is not somebody who goes and knows what a Mace ID necessarily is. So how does that process work? I'm somebody who needs to add a, you know, a texture to Guild Wars. Is there a server that you query? Are there tools? Like, what, what, just give me just a quick sure. idea of what that looks like. So we're using Perforce as our revision control system. Okay. And so they check the file into Perforce, and then there'd be some way that that file was referenced. So perhaps there was a model file. Okay. And the model file, you know, um, using 3ds Max refers to this texture file by name. Okay. And so, uh, and then that model file is referenced in a level file. Okay. Um, and, you know, say it's a tree, since that seems to be the model for today. Um, <laughs> And then the, you know, the level file contains a bunch of different assets in it. And then the level file is actually referenced in some source code. Like, okay. this is level 13 of the game. Or okay. this is like the Lion's Arch outpost. Okay. And so um, what happens is there's a tool, uh, FS build, that goes through and, and it picks up all the code references to assets. And it's like, okay, let me load this level file. And then let me look at the dependencies it has. Oh, it's got a model file in it. Let me load the model file. Let me look at all the dependencies. Oh, it's got a texture file. Let me load that. Oh, textures don't have any dependencies. Okay, so now I can process that file. That file is now file ID3 because it's the third file that was ever processed. Okay, and that whole stack gets processed up into the, the, the piece of data that's actually referenced? That's right. So the textures aren't reference, referenced separately, or they are? They can be referenced separately. That's right. So it processes it and saves file ID3 in this big, giant, you know, uh, data, well, you can think of it as a database of okay. files that okay. has, like, more or less... Every, every uh, version of a file um, back, say, 90 days or something like okay. that. And so when you're doing that, how can you tell that, that you know, I'm an artist, I made a new version of this texture, how do they, does it correlate those? Does it just use the path, the full file path uh, in Perforce as the thing that it knows it's seen this before? So like, you know, that thing kind of tracks those and, and can associate the IDs internally with that, that Perforce path, or? That's right, so FSBuild loads up all the assets and creates this graph of everything. And then like it goes, oh, well that file hasn't changed, I don't have to do anything for it, right? So, because it, it, it has lots of metadata associated with the yes. build process, so it knows when files were last touched. And, and uh, you know, if something breaks, it can like, it knows which artist checked that file in. Okay. Although maybe that's not the reason why it broke, right? Because it'd be the programmer changed some code, <laughs> which caused the, all the art files to break. Okay, all right, sorry, that was a bit of a rattle. I just was kind of curious. I, I wanted to know kind of about that system because it's pretty interesting. Uh, okay, so going back to the networking part of things. So essentially you've got this system where it sounds like there's already kind of one server that we've already sort of talked about what it is, which is like we need something that's sitting there running that has every version of every asset that we've ever shipped on it which can answer this question, right? And presumably we need more than one of these because everyone's getting the data right. from we, this. So how does, how does, talk a little bit about how that works. Sure, so we have lots of these file servers all over the world. So Guild Wars um, is kind of unique in, in its era for being a game that had no monthly fee. And so we couldn't um, have lots of servers to do all this stuff. We needed to be extremely efficient in the way that we did everything. So we wrote everything from scratch because there weren't tools that would do like this delta compression stuff. Yeah. But so we have lots of file servers out there and they're spread out all over the world. And it's kind of interesting why. Um, if you connect to a really uh, long distance TCP server, what happens is um, there's this thing called the TCP window. And uh, so I send you a few messages and you send me back a bunch of stuff, but you're, as a server, you're like, I'm not gonna send you more than 64K of data because I don't wanna flood out the internet. Okay. Um, and until that 64K of data gets uh, acknowledged, I'm not gonna send you more stuff. So you can only have at most 64K of data outstanding. And when you say server, who do you mean? Because you're the, controlling the, the In this server. case, the file server. Okay, so it only sends 64K of data. You've set that up. You picked uh, that. So the TCP stack the actually TCP said, stack. like, the window size is 64K. Okay. And so until we negotiate a bigger window size, that's as much as it'll send. And okay. in Windows uh, of that era, like, you had really limited ability to control TCP parameters. So you couldn't and even especially set Especially on the game client, right? Because, you know, uh, you can't go and hack people's registry. I see. Yeah, nowadays, I guess you can possibly set those options dynamically in code, but then you couldn't. Yeah, but even then, like, it, uh, like Windows XP, you'd have to reboot. Really? Yeah. Okay. All right, so, so keep going. So you're about to say there's problems with this. Right, so uh, what you want to do is instead of, um, instead of trying to get stuff from a really uh, long distance away server um, where, like, 64K, you know, you send it, and then there's a long pause before the acknowledgement comes back, and so you're not constantly filling yes. the stream. So you want to have the, the uh, file server really close to people so that you can send a lot of data more quickly. So okay. the, the, instead of the, um, 
the delay being the limiting factor. Instead, it's the size of the channel being the limiting factor of and how much bandwidth you can send. Is that like workaroundable, meaning like, let's say I actually only had one file server. Uh, it sounds like that's per TCP connection. So in theory, could a client be written to open multiple TCP connections to the server Certainly. so that it can start multiple 64K chunks in parallel? But you decided not to do that, I guess. That's right. You certainly could do that. Um, but what we did is we just distributed servers all over the world, like we had them in Japan, Taiwan, Korea, um, two data centers in the US and a data center in Europe. And okay. that, that was enough to do the job okay. to cover most of our user base. I mean, Australian users had to suffer, but we just couldn't afford to put servers there, too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, Fair enough. Yeah, and so we just had lots of those servers, which creates another interesting problem, which is whenever you want to um, do a build, you have to make sure that every server has all the data before you can really say that the build is truly live. So it's a distributed database commit problem. How did you handle that? Uh, it's actually fairly straightforward. It's like, OK, everybody got the data? Everybody? Everybody ready? Ready? Go! <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, you're like, OK, did everybody get it? OK, we're good, right? And then if one of them didn't get it, then you keep trying again and again. He's like, get it, get it, get it. And then eventually he wakes up. Yeah, but okay. you wait until everybody's got all the data, and then you try and commit the metadata on all the systems simultaneously. And okay. there's only like uh, twice in five years that it ever failed. And wow, OK. And that's uh, so. Like failed in a way that required human intervention. These are database, when you say database, are you talking literally about something that you guys wrote, or are you talking about? That's okay. right. So basically, it's not like we installed MySQL or something. It's like we wrote this thing from scratch to do exactly this job of serving the art assets. That's right. Okay. Yeah, and in fact, like it's embedded in the Gold Wars client. When you see the gw.dat file, it's sort of the database file format that we use for everything. And what kind of load were these servers under? So like, what, what were they designed to serve, basically? How many people updating and how much traffic? I mean, do you have any kind of, uh, just to give people a ballpark, Park. There weren't that many of them. You said six or seven, something it sounded like. There were six data centers. Six data centers. But like within each data center, there were lots of these file servers. There okay, were, so you would just duplicate the file server as many times you needed to for the load in that area? That's right. How much would one typically handle, do you think? Or is that? Uh, so each one would saturate uh, like its uplink at about 400 megabit. Okay. Uh, and they just run like 400 megabit sustained load during peak time. So the m majority of your actual. The, the, the thing that actually prevented you from serving more stuff on a, on a particular server was actually just the outflow pipe. It was, it was actually a combination of factors. So um, it's, file servers are actually really fascinating. Um, and yeah. it's like, really easy to, to do things wrong. But there are two okay. things. There's like, how much the network card could push onto the, the network. Yeah. Um, we were using Blade servers. And so Blade servers, um, unlike you know, individual pizza box servers, Blade servers have a shared network. Or in that era, they had like a shared network um, like infrastructure for the entire uh, row of 14 blade servers. Okay. So you could saturate that would be a problem. So okay. you had to spread your file servers out so they couldn't all be in the same <laughs> rack. They had to be okay. in different racks. Oh my god. Um, the other thing is that the, the amount of data that we're sending is very large. And so um, these servers all had only two and a half gigs of memory. You know, okay. and you've got to um, subtract out some for the operating system and stuff like that. So you could have about a gig and a half of cache, but you've got to have enough space left over for like load file A, load file B, delta compress them. Now you've got file A, file B, and the delta in memory all at the same time. Um, and then you want to keep that in memory as long as you can, because presumably other users want that. But if you keep it in memory too long, then you run out of memory and crash, and so that's no good. I see. So it's this constant thing of like trying not to run out of cache space and trying to avoid virtual memory fragmentation, because these okay. servers are supposed to run for years at a time. And so like, uh, memory fragmentation is a big issue. So we had to use a Fibonacci heap. Uh, Are you serious? Like various different sizes of heap buffers in order to make sure that there's always like a nice slot available for the file that you want to load up. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's a lot of engineering just went into that one server by itself. Yeah, and, the, and the build process to make the build process really fast. Because like, if there's any one thing you can do in your games, you want to make your iteration speed as fast as you possibly can because that's going to determine the quality of your game. If you can only get one build done per day, then when people try and put something in the game and they have to wait to get user feedback, like, they just don't get that feedback right away. We did, um, so over the course of Guild Wars, we did uh, an average of 20 builds a day for four years. It was roughly 10 a day in the beginning and like closer to 30 to 40 a day at okay. the end of the project. So we were just churning builds like roughly every five minutes um, during you know, uh, the ordinary course of business. And then data builds took a bit longer. And so we spent a lot of engineering effort. When I say we, I mean me, myself, and I. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I mean, there were other people who worked on like texture yeah. compressors yeah. and like, uh, you know, like loaders and things like that. But, but FS build was my baby, and like I had to make it fast because that was the core of the of the build time for things. And so every time I can make that faster, I can make it more efficient for like the entire rest of the you know 60 person dev team to get their stuff in and see it. 
And so they, that was kind of a live process because they wanted to be able to, was that, I'm just not sure I totally understand, because obviously iteration, you can iterate internal to the company, but this sounds like something that you're iterating external to the company. It, well, it's really both. Like, you want okay. all the people on your team to be able to see stuff instantaneously, but we started an alpha program in roughly April 2001, where you okay. invited you know, a few friends and family, and that grew within a relatively short period of time to 500 to 2,000 people okay. that we kept through the entire alpha process. And when, we, you know, when some people would leave or get tired or you know, our numbers were not high enough, uh, because of exhaustion of the game, then we'd just bring in more people. Okay. And so, like, our dev build was actually going out to 2,000 people uh, every okay. single time that we did it. So basically, FS build was both the server for your internal, essential, essentially your internal testing and the actual game. That's no right. difference, really. We, we made no difference between devs and alphas. Okay, so uh, let me just ask one other question that I had about, the, about the, the server, although I suppose there are a lot of questions I could ask, but I want to make sure we get sort of coverage of different areas. Uh, so when you said like keeping the, the cache, you were like, I got to load these two files up, I'll do the delta, and then I'll try to keep the, the two files and the delta in, you know, I, I presumably flush the two files, I just keep the delta with a tag on it or something that says, this was the delta between these two files, so if mm -hmm. someone wants that delta, it'll hit the cache and I'll send it out. The idea is presumably that we want that second level of caching because probably most people are up to date. So probably when somebody wanted this delta, someone right after them is going to call for the same delta exactly. kind of thing. Okay. All right, so let's move from file serving uh, down to sort of the next level. So this is, now my client can actually get all of the data that I need to play Guild Wars, and it's self-updating, and it sounds pretty awesome <laughs> in terms of like uh, keeping everyone uh, on the same sort of set of data. Now I need to start talking about how to actually play the game, like how that server infrastructure works. So there's a bunch of things involved there. Why don't you give a little overview of how that works, and then sure. we can kind of drill down to that. So the well. next server you talk to is the lobby server, and that's the one that handles authentication and presence. So uh, again, for people who don't have familiarity with the Guild Wars, uh, it's not like um, in a traditional MMO where you join one map and you stay there for a really long period of time. Instead, you join a particular game and you play there for a brief while, and then you join another game. So I might go to an outpost where there's like 100, 150 people running around, and hey, let's go play in an in a instance map, and then you and I get our own private copy of a two-player or four-player, eight-player world, and we play there for a while, and we finish that, and we go play a tournament game, which is, you know, five teams of eight people, and then we play an arena map, which is two games, two teams of uh, eight people. So we're, we're playing lots of different maps, and so because you don't have a persistent connection, uh, we don't have a way to send you messages all the time. So, okay. so what we do is instead you connect to the lobby server first, and your lobby server connection is persistent, and so when you get whispers from your friends or when we need to send you any notifications, that can all go through that persistent connection through the lobby. So the lobby, you know, you authenticate yourself, uh, you get your friends list, um, you get like your guild information, because uh, it's called Guild Wars, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, like all the other information you need to, to maintain a persistent state. And also um, we establish like some encryption keys because all the data is encrypted back and forth. And is that uh, process, so I guess this is something that probably should be brought up now just so it can be mentioned in different parts of it. So like TCP versus UDP was a big thing you put in the, in the email. It's actually the first thing you said. So do you want to mention briefly like sort of what these different systems are that we're talking about? Were they TCP, were they UDP, and why? It sounds like the file server was TCP because you mentioned the window, the send window. Um, what is, all, what is the lobby server? TCP as well? So or for Guild Wars, everything is TCP. Okay, so everything in the game is TCP, no UDP. That's right. All right. And so... Uh, and instantly, the reason for that was, like, we were going to use TCP, and then we were going to decide later on if we needed to use UDP for the server-to-client protocol. Okay. Uh, we thought we would need to, but it turned out it just wasn't a big issue for the type of game that we were doing. Okay. Um, but, like, it was expedient for us to write a TCP-based game. Okay. And so... Uh, Keep going with that. So I got to collect to the, connect to the lobby server. So I TCP to the lobby server, and I get my information back from that. And presumably this is also going to involve, uh, you said you don't ever do peer-to-peer. -peer. So presumably I'm going to have to route the packets for the rest of the game to the people I'm playing with through somebody. Is that also the lobby server? How does, That's right. So how does that process sort of So start? sure. So um, like briefly, uh, the lobby server talks to the database server. Um, and you know, pulls down all your data, and then after that, it talks to the server, which is uh, it's called SiteServe, but it's like a matchmaking server, and okay. it says, "Player Pat was last in Lion's Arch," and so uh, you know, find a Lion's Arch server, um, and so the the matchmaking server doesn't have any of those yet, right? Because it's a brand new build, or you know, like everything crashed a minute ago, and we're bringing up the whole thing. Or okay. it's like day one of the game, whatever. Okay. Um, and so uh, it has a whole bunch of game servers that have connected up to the matchmaking server and said, "Hi, I'm available to host games. Um, you know, I have X capacity." And so the matchmaking server says, you are going to host the game. Uh, go create a Lion's Arch. Uh, we'll call it District 1. Okay. And um, then 
the server would create that, send back a token to the match server, the match server sends it back to the lobby server, lobby server to the client, oh client's God. got this token, which is like uh, a token that says, I'm allowed to join this game and the address of that game. Okay. So then I join that game and I say, hi, I'm Pat, here's my token, uh, let's encrypt this communication. Then the game server then goes to the database cache server, says, get me the Pat's record. Oh, he's not loaded yet. Database cache server goes to the database server, get me the record. Here's your entire record, which has all your inventory, um, like the parts of the map that you've explored, how much gold you have, you know, everything interesting about your character. So there's a ton of servers in there that you've just mentioned That's just, just all for that. Just the basics, right? Just yeah. for the basics. So, okay, so the first question is, I guess before I ask any more specifics about those, why are there so many servers? So why was this a load balancing thing? Was this just a cleanliness thing or a testability thing? Like, why do we have that many servers involved in just this one process? Sure. Um, so it's really good when you have a lot of complexity to try and simplify your, your uh, program. Because if you're trying to do too many things at once, then if one of them crashes, it takes down everything else. OK. So like isolation of components. Um, also, you know, just from an understanding something standpoint, uh, if you can't understand something, it's really hard to modify. So the smaller something is, the better it fits into the like seven plus or minus two items in your brain, <laughs> right? Um, and each one of those, you know, uh, like things can be separated, right? Separation of concerns is the is the CS um, terminology for that. So basically, your philosoph your approach to this basically would be, if we can define a you know a set of operations that clearly forms something that can all be done with the same set of data. We're going to make that into a separate server if we can. Even if that's going to run on the same machine as some other server, we'd rather have it be like its own sort of self-contained thing that's right. rather than merging these two things together. That's right. And then also, um, you know, another really compelling reason to do that is like you can keep buying bigger and bigger services, but the cost for the server goes up. Instead of being a linear cost, it scales exponentially. So, you know, if you want a four processor server, it's more than twice as expensive as a two processor server. An okay. eight processor is more than four times as expensive as a two processor server. So, so if you can have the ability to distribute these things across lots of cheaper machines, it's a win there as well. That's right. And then also, like when you design your stuff to be, it's called horizontally scalable. Um, you know, like vertically scalable is buy a bigger server, right? But you can only get so big before you run out of, like there isn't a 256 core server that you can just go out and buy, or at least you couldn't in 2004 <laughs> era. Probably not even close, but yeah. Um, yeah, without spending like multi-millions of dollars yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so you, you want to scale horizontally, and it, that causes you to re-architect the way that you write your software. And also then, you know, like, oh, well, one of our auth servers blew up. Right. Big deal. OK. Because you just have lots of auth servers running That's wherever, right. and it's totally fine. OK, so going back to, to sort of the, that, that server breakdown then. So if my philosophy is like lots of little servers, each that does a specific job, I can distribute them anywhere I want, and, and I like programming it that way because then I have a much more well-defined sort of you know, uh, problem space and solution to the problem. Uh, what about sort of the extra interconnect that this generates? Meaning the fact that now these things have to talk to each other, don't I sort of introduce a new failure point or a new thing I've got to get right every time these two servers can't just call a function, they've got to actually now have a packet protocol. How did you approach that? Because that seems like that would then be something you maybe want to systematize or something. I mean, That's right. Tell, yeah. tell me how, how you th thought about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the servers speak a different protocol. Um, and it, it's like you know a, an RPC protocol. It happened to be a custom one, although like there's lots of different versions of that so today. Like today, you'd use protobufs or thrift or okay. uh, message pack or something like that. Okay. Because like, lots of people have studied this problem and figured out the like, right thing to do. Or you know, another new one is Captain Proto. And you um, think these are good, uh, meaning like you've yes, looked at them and, and go, like, these would be, these, we could have used these and they would have been okay. If they existed in that time. If they, frame, yes. if they existed, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, you just need some standardized RPC protocol that in particular has the capability to do versioning because, you know, day one you do something and then like three weeks later you're like, oh, we should have added this parameter. We have a new feature. So you need to think about how you would uh, add additional features without having to like take down all of your servers and do a maintenance period. Um, one of the right. other rather unique things about Guild Wars was that we tried never to do maintenance. Okay. Like we ran 24/7, 365, okay. no maintenance periods, which is extremely unusual. Yeah, that does sound strange. And so, like, um, what you had to do was uh, like rolling upgrades of your servers. Like you'd upgrade one, it had to continue to work. Like new version and old version, well, you know, rather new protocol and old protocol had to continue to work. But now that you've got a new server running, it can speak the new protocol and new, you know, it can do additional functionality. So you take down the servers, you're like, okay, this server's gonna go out of service, everybody get off it, okay, it's, it's empty. Kill, restart with new version. Okay, server number two, you know, get all the users off. <laughs> and is that some kind of a, uh, so that sort of 
scale down, meaning I've got to flush everything off. This is a thing that had to be built into all the servers, I assume, was the concept that like you have to go down for maintenance now, and we built that in from day one, the concept that you can go down for maintenance, you get everyone off, and they go to some other servers, and then we can do whatever kinds of upgrades we're going to do to you. That's right. And this was built into every server, or do you kind of like, so when you talk about having so many servers, and I, I, I can't, again, I can't remember the number, but you had listed so many servers there on that line when you sent me the email. There's, I mean, there had to be, there was over 10, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think there's 18. 18 launch. servers. Did you develop that with a particular, um, I don't want to say framework because you know, that's kind of maybe a loaded term, but did you essentially have some code that is shared between all these servers, which is like, okay, we kind of get this now, maybe a little bit into it, how we want these servers to work, so we kind of built a standard li our, our yes. standard server library. Like, Absolutely. What does that look like? Uh, well, so um, another interesting thing is that like the core of all the servers was one set of code that could do like file handling, memory management, and socket, and uh, hot reloading of, okay. of like modules. Okay. Um, so a module would be like the file server module, or the matchmaking server, or the lobby server um, oh, module okay. could actually be dropped and reloaded dynamically. So, so in a sense, a server instance may be thought of as the lobby server, but really it's sort of the generic server, like top thing, whatever this is, with only the lobby server loaded up and running. But right. technically, if we'd wanted to, we could have also had it load up a matchmaking server. That's right. So okay. um, like the, you know, there, the way to look at it is arena serve, which is the loader module, um, is an executable, and everything else is a DLL. And so okay. like on a, de a developer system, you would actually load up every single DLL so you could have the entire stack of 18 servers running I see. in one And test process. them just right there and see how That's they right. That's pretty fascinating. OK, so, uh, so I guess. So we had to create a protocol to talk to everything, right? And so that protocol library then became part of, um, you know, it could have been part of the core, but because we wanted the capability to update it really frequently, every single server used the same code, but it had it loaded in the DLL, so like it could be updated. Okay, and that's so, called like serve socket. So basically, when you load a DLL, it also includes linked into it its version of whatever the protocol was, because it may be different than the one that, you know, some other thing that might be loaded on it or whatever. Or when we want to have it to, even if we're only loading one, when we want to go away and come back, we don't want to then have to go like, oh, right, he's going away and he's changing his version, so now I have to like switch out the version of my protocol that I'm using. And so it's like, no, it's all just welded into that one DLL. It knows which protocol it was using. But that did come from a shared library that we use internally so that everyone just links to that and knows they can use it. Correct. Okay, wow. Uh, he knows uh, his stuff. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, we, don't ha we don't have nearly as much time left as I would like, of course. Uh, but I, I guess I just want to quickly kind of go through some of these things here and, and get a, a little bit of, uh, a, I guess, of, of your perspective on them. Uh, so talk a little bit about the TCP versus UDP thing, because you'd mentioned that, like I said, on the top of the thing. But you said Guild Wars used all TCP, which is kind of surprising to me. Um, and we I actually had this discussion with some friends uh, recently where I was like lamenting the fact that like I, I you can't actually download a file in a browser like downloading a file in a browser is like a, an unsolved problem half the time it just like stops and then nobody knows why right mm -hmm. and so uh, like Guild Wars I don't think ever had any of these sorts of problems so you know I guess is, does that sort of say that like well you know can you give me a little bit of background, TCP versus UDP, and how do you, if you're going to do TCP, how did you do it right versus doing it wrong? Because I see so many things where it's obviously done wrong. Does that make sense as a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is TCP versus UDP. So TCP is a reliable ordered protocol, which means like um, even if you receive data out of order, mm -hmm. then you'll wait for the, the piece that was supposed to come before it and mm -hmm. insert that so that everything shows up in a nice stream. It's like reading a file, yeah. except that you know sometimes the file like handle gets broken and you yeah. can't read any more from it. Uh, whereas UDP, you can send lots of packets. Uh, they arrive um, in any order that is unguaranteed, and some of them don't ever arrive at all. Yeah. And so, um, you know, obviously TCP and UDP are built on the same underlying primitives, and TCP just has a lot of mechanisms to ensure that the reliable ordered guarantee actually happens. And you know that may be not what you want for your game because if you're doing a first-person shooter, um, like you're sending uh, like position and angle, like, or, or you know, position and velocity, something like that, so that um, you know, at any moment in time when I receive a packet, I know exactly where you are and where you're headed. But if I lose one of those, I don't care because I'll get the next one, and right. which is your new position. And in yeah. fact, it would be bad to receive a, an old stale packet because now you're going to pop backwards in time. So TCP would be a terrible protocol for that. But for uh, an MMO, it actually works really well because almost every single message that you would send is uh, something that you would have wanted to know uh, correctly, right? Like, I picked up this, right? That is not a message that you can lose because if you did, then like multiple people could pick up the same item. Uh, and so reliable ordered uh, protocol works really well. 
the downside to reliable order is um, like on some devices, like in mobile devices, for example, you lose those connections all the time, right? You're on the bus, you go through a tunnel, and TCP doesn't uh, survive that trip through the tunnel. Whereas UDP, you know, the phone can keep going, no, really, try again, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Um, and so UDP works great for mobile devices if you need like a high bandwidth connection. If you're gonna do something low bandwidth, like um, you would just use a simple RESTful interface, like HTTP. But what happens, so TCP connections are not necessarily reliable either, so presumably the game kind of has to deal with that state as well. And is that, like I said, kind of using the, the, uh, the straw man of the, the browser that can't seem to download a file for some reason, is that just basically about, okay, the game just has to be smart about checking the connections, no, if I haven't received anything in a certain amount of time, kill it, start another one. Like, how much logic would you say you have to put into making a TCP connection work the way it needs to for a game versus the way it needs to apparently for a file browser or, or a web browser? Yeah, um, I mean, if you were to look at the socket library for all of our servers and the client, it's all like the same kind of stuff. Um, there's probably a thousand lines for Windows 95 and a thousand okay. lines for NT. Okay. So it's not a huge amount of code. Uh, I think it's more the conceptual model that you have when working with sockets okay. is that you just have to assume that it could break at any moment in time okay. and plan for breaking. So we had sort of a coding standard at, in uh, uh, Renanet which was like don't have functions return failure. So don't return Boolean values like I failed, something went wrong, except for a couple of cases. Um, one of them is sockets and the other one is files. Okay. Like if you, if you open a file, like obviously it can fail. Yes. Um, but like for memory allocation, it either succeeds or your program blows up. Okay. Um, you can set a flag saying, you know, uh, I'd like to know if this would fail, and then you can, like, it'll like actually a probe, return, basically. Yeah, it'll return null and say, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't allocate that memory. Okay. And, but that code is obviously prepared to deal with that failure case. But the idea is, like, if you try and load a model file and it doesn't load up, what the heck are you going to do? Okay. Well, you know, you can crash the game, but that's yeah. not very user friendly. So okay. we just show a white box, like a okay. six foot square. Box. So you basically always had a case where it's like, when we do something that we know can fail, we, the code is designed around the fact that that's actually just a legal operating condition. Like, I'll either get this model or I won't. It's not, it, it's not an imperative, basically. Right, well, so uh, for the model file, I'll always get a model file. I can ask if it's valid after oh, I load okay, it. Oh, okay, I see. But for a socket, you just have to look at it and go, like, at any moment this thing can fail, and so what's my you know, failure resolution for that? And of course, okay. a lot of testing doesn't hurt either. Yeah. Okay, and so, uh, so you never really had any misgivings about using TCP then. You felt like that was totally fine as long as you architect around the fact that you expect it to, to maybe go down, go back up, that sort of thing. Yes, although like um, in practice, the thing that really affected us the most was, um, you know, at any moment in time, like somebody is doing maintenance on their gear somewhere. Okay. And um, so like, you know, your packets are taking one path, like they're hopping through 18 different routers to get from your house to the servers. And you know, uh, gamers play at night, maintenance periods are at night, and so, yeah. um, like the routes change, and or, or like um, the you know the company that's publishing our game uh, decides that they're going to do maintenance in their data center and, and switch um, their devices, and you would think like I mean you know this was in 2005 right like Cisco had been making routers since the 1980s <laughs> yeah. that they would have had solved this problem. All right. But there's this thing it's called you know route convergence, and like what happens is your router takes like 30 seconds before like you have a, a okay. you know, an active st uh, passive set of routers right and this the, the active gets taken down either by you know uh, manual control or like it just fails and yeah. the other one's supposed to pick up and it takes such a long time that your TCP connections all get torn down okay and you know so you talk to the the folks in the data center and say oh yeah routes are converging what the fuck does that mean <laughs> <laughs> Right, what it means is that like, you know, 70,000 players just lost their connection. Like half of our users just lost their connection. It does sound like something that in a sci-fi film could be about a bunch of people losing, like the great convergence is hap it's upon us. Yeah. Some, some routes are getting, yeah. Right, whereas okay. if you use UDP, then you, know, you have much more control over that process because you, know, you can just keep trying and eventually routes will converge and um, you know, your packets will start getting through again. And so why didn't you guys decide to do something like, for example, use your own you know, reliable stuff on top of UDP or something like that? It just never became that much of an issue? Or? Sure, yeah, it, the game worked well enough, okay. and like, we had plenty of technical challenges to solve that weren't uh, that. after launch. Okay. You know, because that, that problem didn't really crop up until after launch, okay. when, when you know, we started seeing maintenance periods from our publisher. Like, I see. Really, can you guys not do that? that right. Just don't change stuff, <laughs> right? Because changing things breaks them. So, uh, and one more question on that, because you were talking about like first person shooter versus uh, non or whatever. Guild Wars still is kind of an action-y game in the sense that I do see people like walking around and doing these sorts of things. Why do I not want that sort of UDP-likeness for that portion of it where I'm just sort of sending where guys are and I don't really want to know where they were, you know, 30 seconds ago if that packet got dropped, I don't care anymore. 
what, like, was that just not that important, or was there reasons why for Guild Wars it, that, that's not true in the same way? Right, well, so we could have designed the game differently so it was more uh, first-person shooter action-y, but we wanted to make a game that was less Twitch-focused, okay. and so like, all these things feed into each other. Right? We had lots of different business rationales and gameplay rationales and technical rationales that we merged together to form our game, and like they all sort of overlap with each other. So like, yeah, we could have done arrow combat where you fire an arrow and you yeah. have to be aiming in the right direction, but we right. decided that was not what, what the spirit of the game that we were trying to build okay. was. So when you fire an arrow, like, you know, you're actually over there because you've been running this way, and so I don't know that yet because of network latency, so I fire the arrow, and the arrow, like, it doesn't really do, you know, it doesn't really yeah. curve in space, but like conceptually that's what it's doing, even if you can't see it, right? Because on, on my system, you're standing over there, I fire, it hits you, but really, you're standing over there, so, you know, you see me in a different place. The Doing a different still, thing. On your system, it looks one way, on my system, it looks another. The same resolution happens, right? At the point the arrow is fired, we decide whether it's going to hit or not. It has nothing to do with motion. And I suppose that's a good, uh, let's see, we, like I said, we're, we're super low on time, unfortunately. But um, so I suppose that's a good thing to tie it back to the earlier games as well. So uh, we haven't talked much about how the architecture works for the actual gameplay inside Guild Wars. So it sounds like this is maybe sort of a hybrid of the two in some sense, meaning it's like a little bit of lockstep, because we're going through a server now, so obviously everything's getting resolved in one place, which is a little bit more like a lockstep sort of thing. But it's also very asynchronous in the sense that what the client sees is sort of just trying to represent what it got from the server in some way. So could you talk a little bit about how you decided to do that? And was that informed a lot by sort of the experience with Warcraft, Diablo, Starcraft? Right. So, um, you know, in Guild Wars, what happens is the server is authoritative for any important decisions, like where players are actually located, uh, who owns which items. But clients do their best to model that in a way that uh, seems seamless to users. So if I start walking, I don't have to go and ask the server, hey, is it okay if I walk over here? I already know all the collision information that's local to my system. I know where all the players are, and I know where all the objects in the world are. And so I can effectively, um, you know, perform pathfinding around those things uh, you know, and uh, like if I bump into a wall, my local client will tell me, you know, back up a little bit, or you know, you can't interpenetrate that wall. Um, and you know, I'm telling the server the whole time while I'm doing this, and the server's uh, telling me what is actually true, so it can provide modifications. Okay. So if there were a bunch of people standing in my way, um, you know, and I didn't quite know that that was true yet because they all sort of formed a wall right before really I quickly, tried to pass yeah. through. Then um, you know, in my system, I might uh, actually have to teleport back a little bit. But okay. by and large, the the rate of communication that you have with the server is high enough that you don't see those artifacts. Okay. But but if you did, then the server just says, "Nope, uh, I'm telling the truth. You have to move back." Okay. So basically, you you sort of have a model where uh, the, the the client side is effectively running the game as much as it can run the game, and it's getting what are amount to corrections from the server as to like, hey, yeah, you, you moved there, and I understand you drew that, but that was wrong, so you know, move the guy back and like, correct this sort of state, that, that sort of thing? That's right, or you know, if you want to pick up an item, then what happens is you initiate the pickup request, and now you have an animation sequence that like, takes a while to get yeah. done, so that the likelihood is that the round trip to the server has already elapsed, so um, you know, it's not like you, tr you pick up something instantaneously and it disappears right. and it's like, oh wait, you didn't get it. it. It takes a while and like it could disappear before you pick up the object. And how does that sort of thing, like what's it like programming with that understanding in general? Like do, do you find that there's, do you find that that's a completely uh, new process every time yes. or is there a certain systemic nature to that programming? Like, do I have to think about it when I write the code to pick up the object, or is there more of a system that I did? Like, can you give a little bit of a perspective so on how that works when I'm writing the code that's different from if I wasn't doing networking? Yeah, so there's two things that I think are really helpful. One is to model everything as if it takes a minute to do each action. Okay. But, you know, like, like a ridiculous amount of round trip time, or, or an hour, right? Because you start to think about the problem differently, right? It's like, well, I have to ask the server something. Well, every time I do that, it takes a minute round trip. And okay. you start thinking about, like, oh, well, there's a lot of failure cases in there. Somebody could pick it up in that interval of time. Um, so what am I going to do about that? And, and so it helps think about problems differently. The other is that you should inject simulated latency in your servers. And in fact, you should not run servers locally um, you know, in your office. Like, since most people are doing cloud-based games these days, that's not so much of an issue. Yeah. But even then, like, look at your servers far away, or if you have the code budget for it, then go put in simulated latency. So that, okay. um, and especially simulated jitter. Um, right, so, so the latency changes over time. Like sometimes it's really quick, sometimes it's really long. That's right. So a minimum of 200 milliseconds. Like uh, for the last game I worked on, we were using uh, 200 and 250 to 500 milliseconds. Okay. So there was a lot of jitter in there. Okay. And that really helped, um, like, because you could feel like when the problems showed up. I see. Like you know, if you click on a button and then nothing happens. 
Hey, I think I need to, you know, the dialogue, the user interaction first off has to change. Like when I click a button, something should happen on the local system um, that indicates that I've accomplished that action. And then, uh, you know, I'm, and like, you know, the dialogue changes now, like I'm, tr I'm trying to do something else. Yeah. Um, and that way, you know, uh, you don't have this stall where the client feels unresponsive. So you would say that pretty much all of the code that's gameplay, you know, user facing kinds of code at that point, pretty much all gets written with the network in mind. It's not really a separate thing where, you know, like for example in, in the Warcraft one where you could almost imagine it being separate, two separate systems that don't really have to think that hard about each other. In this case, it's like, no, if you're a gameplay coder on this thing, you need to think about how that works and that's just part of your day-to-day -day writing the code. Kind of Absolutely. Thing. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, let's see here, yeah. Oh man, we need, we need like another hour. So uh, I guess I'll just, just quickly mention some of these things that you sort of uh, said before and you can see if maybe you can give a little bit of background here. So uh, some of the things that you talked about like uh, in, in the email that, that you sent me was like things we could talk about. Uh, you sort of talked about stuff like uh, hacking and encryption and these sorts of things and peer-to-peer -peer versus server. It's like sort of, and, and then there was like, uh, you know, OS choice for, for, you know, were you going to be Linux or Windows for hosting the server and all these sorts of things. So I guess my, my sort of broad question on that stuff is, there's a tremendous amount of new things you kind of have to think about if you want to do one of these games. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular resource, like, uh, I, I don't know if maybe, like, uh, you said you did a talk on one of these at one point, but, like, has anyone compiled sort of, like, things you should think about for your network game from some experts that kind of just go through, like, you know, it's not trying to tell you how everything needs to do, but it's bringing up all of the points, so you know you should think about all these things, because there were things on that list that I'd never even heard of before, right? So, yeah. Um, so I, what, where would I you start? I couldn't point you to a specific blog or... Um, or a book, but yeah. they do exist out there. Okay. Um, and you just have to look for like game network programming and okay. like, the issues do get raised. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing to be aware of is that whatever you create will be hacked. Um, okay. Because some people uh, really enjoy the process of hacking, and so their game is, uh, you know, different from what you think you're selling. Right, right. Um, <laughs> you know, just like some people like to grief. Like, if you don't take griefing into account in your game, um, and it can be griefing your players, or it can be, you know, griefing you, the, the game um, operator, right? Like, when they take down your database yeah. for fun. Yeah. Um, so, like, you have to think about rate limiting so that people can't try and do too much stuff at one time. You have to think about, like, the interaction model so that um, I can't get my guild together and we can all like attack you at one time with, with whisper messages and like push you off the internet. I see. Um, you know, like uh, you don't want to expose other players' um, IP addresses because, you know, in the old days, like I could send you the ping of death and kill your computer. Oh, um, the yeah, ping so of death. The ping of death. I would send you an ICMP packet that would cause your computer, your Windows computer to crash. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Um, <laughs> How many, how many players can you do that to today? Yeah. Um, you know, like for example, we had a bug in the uh, Guild Wars chat system at one point where uh, we had these color codes that you could send along, but it wasn't perfectly validated. And so there's a color code that you could use that would, if you sent that color code, it would cause clients to crash. Okay. And so all of a sudden we started seeing like this, like weird effects in our concurrency graph. And we, we would get um, alerts like, you know, something's going wrong, like lots of players are disconnecting, like our concurrency isn't stable. And we're also getting lots of crash reports. You have to have really good crash reporting for your, for your game, right? So we'd see stack dumps of what was going on, and we were able to immediately look at it and go, well, look, the text processor is crashing. And so, like, um, oh, we're, you know, we were able to figure out really quickly, somebody's sending data that's not valid, yeah. uh, patch the game, five minutes later, we have a new build of the game out and the problem is fixed. Okay. Right, so that's, again, where iteration speed is really important. But, like, in literally everything you do, you have to think about the, the griefing and hacking aspects of it. Yeah, I guess that's something that happens with network games that really just doesn't happen anywhere else. Because if someone wants to hack their own game that they're playing single player, that's just fine, right? It's like there's no problem. But once you do network, you kind of open this whole... <laughs> yeah, and, and even more than that, it's the responsibility of the programmers and designers. Um, there's no legal recourse you have, right? Because the players can be living overseas or right. they can be underage and so you can't stop right. them. So like the worst hacker we ever had in Guild Wars was like this 15-year-old kid named Pablo from France. And you know, like... <laughs> Pablo from France. We were able to identify him and uh, like we'd talk to his parents from time to time. <laughs> but he never stopped. <laughs> How does that phone call go? Yeah, was we really call. like little Pablo to stop mm. taking down the Guild Wars the server. The problem is he was making too damn much money. Okay. So, uh, you know, like he could sell items online. But okay. the thing is we started watching him really closely and watching what his interactions with the game were. Okay. And we were able to identify bugs before he could really uh, take advantage of them in a big way. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, so I think we're, we're just about out of time. So I, before we finish, I wanted to leave time for you told me you walked up here right before you were going to uh, start talking. And you said, you want to say something about how do I get a job in the game industry? Because I had asked Mike about that. You had something you want to say. So we've got time. Sure. What um, did you want to say? So I mean, it's the number one question I get asked. So I figured rather than like everybody rushing down here uh, like afterwards and hitting up all of us about how to get a job, I'd talk about what I think are the right uh, right things to do. Um, you know, number one, I mean, I think the game industry is great because I worked here for so many years. Um, but uh, I think uh, like the one thing that people really need to have is demonstrable passion. And so passion is an excitement for stuff. I mean, it sort of relates to the curiosity that, that Mike was talking about. But um, demonstrable means that you have something that you can show. And it doesn't have to be a game, but it can be like, here's some code that I wrote that wasn't just for a class project or something. Or if you're a designer, like here's this level I designed in you know, whatever, Half-Life 2, like my own level that I did that nobody else participated in at all. And look at all these cool things I did and I can talk about. It. And it's great stuff that you can bring to you and talk about in the interview um, that shows that you, know, you haven't just done your schoolwork. Um, I've interviewed tons of people and they always say, oh, well, not, not all of them, but like a, a bunch of people will say, well, you know, I was so busy with school, I just didn't really have time to do extracurricular activities like writing code. Yeah. Like, Bullshit. <laughs> you know, we all, we all have a certain amount of hours in the day and we just choose what we want to do. And it could be watching TV or hanging out with friends or whatever. But if you're really passionate and you want to be successful at something, you know, when you're early in your career. <laughs> <laughs> It, then you know you have to find a way to demonstrate that. Um, so I think that really helps a lot. And you can also contribute to other people's projects, but I think that that's uh, it's harder to demonstrate. Like, well, this is what I did. Um, uh, and you know, like um, looking at hiring, like uh, you know, lots of people have tried programming tests and whiteboard tests and things. But um, unlike the financial in industry, past performance is a predictor of future success. Okay. And so okay. <laughs> the best way to yeah. hire is to look back at what somebody's done in the past, because that is the best predictor of what they will do in the future, beyond any other thing that you can do. OK. Um, so demonstrate that you've done something. OK. Um, I also like uh, coding interviews are really hard. Like uh, just about any company you go to, um, like any bigger company, is going to have a really hard uh, coding test. They're going to grill you all day long. There's a great book for this. It's called Cracking the Coding Interview. And if you can just solve every problem in that book, you'll get a job anywhere you want. And so like, <laughs> it's funny, but like, people go to college for you know, four years or something like that. And then they're like, well, I, maybe I'll study a little bit for, for the interview. No, like the interview is the most critical thing you can do to get a job at the place that you want. So treat it like it's a college course and put like a month into that book and solve every single problem in the book. Yeah. Right? And, then, and then you get a job anywhere. I, I guess I didn't know that there was a, such a book. These, would these be applicable to game companies even though? I mean, Absolutely, yeah. Really, OK. All the stuff is the kind of questions that uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook, okay. Microsoft ask these ask. days. But what about companies? You know, or like, for example, the companies I've worked at too. Like you know, really? ArenaNet, I wrote the coding test there. And it's, okay. it's, you know, some of the problems are very similar, similar? to things that okay. I Similar, OK. So you think it kind of does map well even across the board? Yeah. Like you know, the kind of stuff we did, reverse a link list in place. Oh, OK. Sing singly linked list in place, right? Okay. You know, stuff like that. It's yeah. really common. OK. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much for talking with us, Pat. That sure. was uh, that was fantastic. I wish we had Thank more. Thank you. Time.